and uh, NHA from this event. Uh, we'll be sharing with everybody um, today's journey. Um, so, okay, so.
needs the service at some point in your life. You want to get something from the media based business cards or books like I wanted to, marketing materials, branding for your business. And it just didn't make sense to me why this would be so difficult. Uh, and that was the birth of the idea for Printbook. And the idea was how do you create a business uh, which for the common man or for somebody who, who's even doing this for years, so ordering printed products for years, how do you make it seamless for that customer uh, to get the best quality product at the right price without worrying too much about what goes in the back end, right? Because I don't care what somebody uses to print something uh, as long as it looks good and I'm happy with the quality. Uh, and I think one of, the, one of the biggest questions that anybody needs to answer for themselves when you conceptualize a new idea is, are you really thinking about a disruptive product? Or are you just adding disruptive processes to an existing product or an existing industry? It's a very subtle difference, right? But if you think about what iPhone did to the phone space, it, it was a disruptive product. It changed the way people thought about phones. But a lot of other businesses, you make my trip or Flipkart or any other e-commerce successful business today, is that really a disruptive business? I mean, they're doing retail. They're selling products that are third-party branded products, right? But what they've done in a disruptive way is the way they're offering them and the competitive edge that they're offering to their platform is a year or so. So I think it's very important for you guys to, to articulate, or anybody, to articulate in your mind, what is it that I'm really doing? Because that will substantially change the way you approach uh, your idea, right? And one of the biggest things that people, uh, you know, I think this is a myth, but when you think about an e-commerce business, actually, let me ask you guys, what is the first thing you think you need when you want to launch an e-commerce business? Any, anything that comes to mind right away? Idea. Idea is one. Okay, so you need that as a basic foundation. What else? What, what's the next thing that comes to mind? Technology, Technology platform, website, right? You know, this to me is, maybe it's just a different way of looking at it. I, I personally don't believe that e-commerce is a business, right? In itself, it's just an enabling mechanism for you to do something, but the actual underlying business is something else. So for me, it was printing. Uh, for a make my trip is travel. For a flip card, it's, it's retailing of consumer goods. And I think it's very important for anybody, and especially for me, right? Because I spent four years in finance. I didn't know the ABC of printing. So if, you know, I would go into these printers and ask stupid questions, and we love that. Uh, but it was important for me to go through that step just to develop the confidence that, hey, I understand the business. E-commerce in itself is very easy. It's technology, it's website, it's an enabled user experience, it's how you design flow, how you, you know, design your customer service. But you know, it's really important to get that business right, the underlying business right. And for me, therefore, the, the conscious decision was, I'm going to spend the first five, six months just working at a print shop. Right? Work in wherever the hub of printing is, for you if it's not a retail, wherever. Work in that industry. Ask a dumb question. Right? Meet, the, meet the experts in the industry, understand their challenges, understand what the business is. Because when you want to add a layer of e-commerce to it, there needs to be that fabric of, hey, I know what I'm getting into, as opposed to I'm starting a new business. Because you might not be. And if you, you know, relate the first question of, is it really a disruptive product versus a disruptive process, once you have that answer, plus you have the answers to the industry-specific questions, then you're really arming yourself, right? There's a term I like to use, which is armed and dangerous. Like you, when you go out there in the real world, in the entrepreneurial world, you want to be armed and dangerous because you're going to have a lot of uncertainty anyways. So the basic concept of what you're doing should be very firm up in your mind. And I've seen a lot of, even as an investor, I've seen a lot of investors fall in this trap of, hey, I need money to set up a website, I need money to set up a team, I need capital to do XYZ marketing, branding exercises. And I really ask the basic fundamental question, do you understand your business yet? Right? Do you know what you want to do? So for me, that's the, the, the biggest thing that, that you should focus on. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of this, but this one's important. And I think part of my story, when I look back, this is one thing that really worked for me. Um, as an investor coming from that industry, the easiest and most handy thing for me was to go out to an investor and raise money, right? I need angel funding, I need CUSA, I need blah, blah, blah. But I intentionally told myself that I'm not going to do this with capital. I'm going to do this with an idea. I'm going to pretend that I'm a beggar off the street. I have zero money in my bank account. And can I still make this idea work? Can I still overcome my fears of, hey, isn't he ready for online printing? Can people really go online or order a business card today? Would they want to do that when there are 
dozens of coffee shops on every nook and corner of the streets, right? But people really do this. And many times that notice when you when you look at it through the lens of capital, very quickly your your goal becomes chasing numbers as opposed to really forming up your hypothesis on business. So it's a lot tougher in the beginning years to, to start with minimal capital, but I think you guys really need to think about what is it that I can offer to potential vendors, to potential, even the basic industry that I'm in. So what I, what I did initially was I had a lot of canvassing jobs. I did anything and everything in printing. Uh, a lot of these were uh, you know, foreign export orders to a basic Google app that I would send out. And they would generate enough cash for me to keep funding the online business without really burning any cash. And more importantly, helping me learn about the industry, right? So I was in the process of making money and funding my business. I was actually learning about the industry. And I thought that's important. How do you learn something without really paying for it? Uh, and that should be the mantra front and center of your mind as you go about really starting a business. Once it gets stabilized, I guess you'll have a lot of investors not coming to go anyways. Uh, but in the beginning period, I think it's, it's important to overcome that hump that capital is about, right? Uh, a lot of people mention technology, right? Now, the way we set up the website, the website for Printwell, I basically found this, uh, this, this company in Endeavor. And I bought myself there for four months. And the deal was, look, so I have printing domain knowledge that I spent six months here. There's a lot of technical aspects of this model that you guys will need. And you guys obviously have the program knowledge. While we work together, you build this thing for me for free, right? But once you develop this, you can sell this as a license to companies outside here. And today, you know, that company um, has close to 200 licenses that they have, very different licenses that they've given out to foreign companies. So it was a win-win for both of us. I didn't have to put in any capital. Uh, I learned a lot about programming because I was sitting in the office and doing a few little. And the amount I paid then was probably less than what I would have paid to rent on the end of for three or four months that I was there. So I think it's really things like those that you have to think about and really push yourself to ask, what do I have to offer? Right? Okay, I have this idea, I want to set up this business. Can I do something now that will still help me make money or get me the basic technology to get the proof of concept, right? And the answer there is not always capital. Uh, it's a lot of other soft aspects to your personality, your experience, your background that you could bring to the table. And I, I would just encourage you guys to constantly think about those. Um, this is, I mean, this is nothing new, right? If, if you are going to be an entrepreneur, you, you have to be ready for years. I. I had innumerable stories where so my parents, my friends, uh, a lot of my friends when I left Waterloo ended up going to Harvard and Morton and Stanford and getting their MBAs. And here I was starting a business card or a visiting card printing business online. So a lot of people thought I needed to shrink, um, at least at that point, including my family. But I think you have to be ready for that. You, 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 there, there's, sometimes it's just conviction. It, it's some divine force that helps you walk through that difficult phase. But I think more importantly, you really got to believe that what you're doing will lead you to your end point. And hopefully that end point is, is very aspirational and very ambitious, very ambitious. Because otherwise that journey will not make sense. Uh, I have a lot of dinner table conversations with my father who you know, walking on me um, like 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock at night and I was studying business cards on a, on a big oil machine, a cutting machine. And he's a big industrial machine, right? but I had to do it because I don't to do everything. And he would, he would casually ask, look, I spent uh, a lot of money, I went through a lot of pain to send you to the U.S., get you this degree. When you were at Warburg, you were in banking, you were flying first class, you were placing with hotels. I thought my son had made it. And now, uh, what you're doing just doesn't make any sense to me. So help me understand what you're doing. And those are difficult conversations, right? Because A, there's, there's a generational gap. B, there is... It's just concern for your family and friends. They, they, they want you to be successful. They want you to do the right thing. And then they want to give you the advice wherever it's appropriate. Uh, but I think it's important for you to go through that phase. It, it's a very important building block of you becoming a successful entrepreneur. Because the only thing you face your fears is when you get the freedom to really elaborate your wings and, and get out there and do what you want. So I think it's an important thing that you shouldn't shy away from. Uh, in, in many cases, I think it's really helpful. Um, I want to touch one last thing, and I really want to open up the Q&A then, because I think this is a session more for you guys, and it's for me laughing about my, my experience, my journey. Uh, just the model is a very really interesting thing, and, you know, coming from a finance background, I, this was some very odd, but for the first couple of years, I intentionally didn't even look at my balance sheet and my email. I just, I would refuse to look at it. 
I will, I will get on every customer phone call. I will understand what people are saying about the product, about the service. I will like it. I will see value in it. Uh, are they coming back to me for the same product? Those things are a lot more important to me uh, than what my top line is or what my OI is. And it's, it's a very weird paradox, right? Because if you an MBA degree or you spend time as an investor or you work in any corporate, the first thing that's thrown into your head is, you know, when will the services make money? When will it be even? When, when does it make sense from an economic perspective to invest in this? I think, I think it's, you, know, you have to decide when you want to do that. But I actually think it's perfectly okay if you don't want to do that with those stuff like this. I mean, especially for me, you know, having worked on all that million dollar acquisitions and deals, for me to see those key numbers for my pretty well uh, balance sheet, honestly, I would just be depressed. And, you know, I would never be able to go back to work the next day because I would really question myself uh, as to what I'm doing. So, I, I don't think numbers are always the right metric to judge a business. I think you, especially when you're trying to do something that's very new to market. Right? So when Big Metric came 12 years ago, people said, yeah, India may, there's a travel shop every you know, corner, there are agents who do this for a living for years, generations. Why would somebody go to the website and pay and buy a fish, right? But Make my Metric make believed in it. The first three, four years were very tough for them. They didn't get the traction that they wanted. If they looked purely at financials, they would never be the business they are today. And once the market came around and people changed the way they paid, that's human tendency, that's the way the world works. Today, they get they, you know, close to 50% of the market is still pretty that, despite uh, very strongly backed financially or strategically backed players being in that space. Uh, and I think that's, that's a leap of faith that you need. Uh, as long as you believe your idea is working, I think numbers come secondary. But it's a, it's a difficult bridge to, to cross. Um, I'll quickly talk about Printel, and I just want to touch the aspect of why I sold to Mr. Print versus going through the VC lab. I think for me, as I said, you know, being that beggar off the street and finding the business through the self-generated cash was a big win. So three years later, when Pringle was growing 10 times month over month practically, we had more than 75% retention rate for our customers. I mean, yes, this is something that works in India. And I would take it to investors. I all of a sudden have a lot more leverage. And I'm still raising the amount of money that I needed without offloading the majority stake in my company. And that's very important because you know, the whole point of being an entrepreneur is to have your own baby and watch that baby grow as far as you, right? And many times when you raise a lot of rounds early on, by the time you get to the true growth phase of the business, you already might want to be shareholder. And you know, somebody else mentioned in the previous session this idea of control and you have to give it up. It's not easy, right? Because you, you set this thing up and you have certain hypotheses, you have a vision, and you want to go through with that vision in its fullest before you start making trade offs. So I think. That really helped me. And the decision for going to a financial investor versus a strategic partner like this event was really, what is my end goal, right? What is my dream? My dream is to build a robust uh, business in India in the printing space. Now, how do I get there? I can get there by raising money to VCs. I can spend the next five years developing a lot of the technology, the processes. Printing in itself is very, very, um, Nuance because if you if I ask you today, give me one prominent printing company name, you probably won't even be able to think of it, right? It's an industry that has existed for years and years. It's the oldest industry, but yet no single player has really been able to scale up. Uh, it continues to remain a very fragmented, very unscaled job work type industry. And therefore, what we were doing with Printbell, or even what this print does, there's a lot of uh, how do you use technology to bridge the gap of scale um, with quality. And the business and I saw the advantage of not having to invest my next five or seven years in technology, but instead focusing on how do I really grow this everything in India, how do I think about channels, how do I think about customers. Um, and at the end say, five years later, ten years later, am I ending up at the same position that I would have ended up if Printbell was funded by VC, so from a financial perspective, from a business growth perspective? And the answer to that question is yes. So why wouldn't you do that? I think it's a mental block sometimes that if you sell your company, you finish as an entrepreneur. I think there are, there are a lot of questions that you guys need to ask yourself. And if, if the strategic partner is also very entrepreneurial, right? So this is today, the founder and CEO, Robert, um, is still a majority stakeholder in the company. The way the company is run in different geographies is very, very autonomous, very, very sort of run as their own operating unit. So you get this amazing mix of very entrepreneurial on the ground, right? But then you have this 
comfort factor of the big MC for resources, technology, know-how, um, having done this in other markets, so you know what the pitfalls are kind of uh, added. So I think that marriage is, you know, could work, uh, and therefore financial investors shouldn't always be the, the default option. I think there, there should be also consideration for other avenues that you could look at. Um, I think in terms of what I wanted to cover, that that really is, is pretty much it. I, uh, we just launched this print uh, three or four months ago, so one thing I will tell you for a fact, that print bill, there was a lot of roll up your sleeves, do it, don't care about whether it's right or wrong, you figure it out. If it's wrong, too bad, you move on. Um, in a bigger corporate setup, sometimes you need to give decisions a lot more thought. There's a lot more process behind it. Sometimes it really works for you, sometimes it doesn't. It slows you down as well. So I think it's a, it's a matter of striking that balance and it will be a journey, uh, another journey that I will embark on starting from now on uh, being a part of this event. But as the business grows, I think the excitement of the model and what we're trying to do in India uh, should be counter positive energy enough to, to overcome some of the other traditional models. So that's, that's where we are. And I, I really want to open it up to questions uh, that you guys might have. Uh, about starting business, funding, etc. So this is going to be the great one. Uh, yeah. I think you can speak up loud. I agree. What is entering a new business when there are no benchmarks or competitors? How do you manage to focus? That's a great question. And you know, printing was like that. So when Print Bell was launched in 2007, there wasn't a single company, not just in India, but I started looking at China, Singapore, other you know, Asian markets. There was not a single company that was doing online stage printing. Uh, yes, I had some knowledge of this print and I looked up foreign models, but you know, those models are not going to be applicable to India. I think there's a lot of it, philosophically speaking, there's a lot of conviction, but importantly, there is also analysis of what is your value proposition? So if I look at the printing business today, I would be shocked if any printer has margins of more than 20%. I'm talking gross margins, not even that So that's how the business works. When I conceptualize unit economics of print though, our gross margins could be easily 4 to 65 percent, right? When I looked at this print it was a public company, they were consistently delivering 65 percent plus gross margins. So it was something that, hey, if you do it right, you can get to that end point. So you need some benchmarks like that. Um, but for the most part, I think it is it is conviction and it is understanding what's your value proposition. For me, when I would you know deliver the print bill cards to customers, what was amazing was people would actually call back in and say, "I love this card, I love this book." Now that doesn't happen in India, right? The, the Indian mindset psyche is: if I'm not happy, I will you know cry and shout. But if I'm happy, then I will just you know stay quiet and not say anything. But the fact that people were coming out of the way and saying, look, this is the same amount of money I would spend uh, elsewhere at local shop, but what you're giving me is substantially better in terms of quality, that tells you, okay, the product's working. Let's worry about scale later. If your basic product quality works, your value proposition works, you know you can hit numbers at scale um, that will be sustainable, um, then I think you, you still keep going, even though you don't have real benchmarks in the industry. But it's a tough one. Yeah. How important is it to... Uh, it's okay if you don't break even in those three years. But what are you going to prove after those three years? There are a lot of businesses that don't really have a five-year cycle, right? Now, most investors have a five-year exit horizon. So they are always pushing the entrepreneur to say, look, I invest money today. What is this going to look at five years? Now, there are a lot of businesses. Make My Trip is one great example. But there are a lot of other businesses, even in the non-e-commerce space, where, where it really is a 10-year horizon. And therefore, what you want to do is not bog yourself down on pure numbers, even if it's for a three or five years. You can grow revenue, you can be optimizing on your marketing cost of acquisition line, you can be optimizing on your gross margins line, but can you really articulate where do you want to end up in five years? Uh, maybe from a non-numerical perspective. And a great example of this is the biotech industry, right? Now sometimes biotech industries go through 10 years of R&D before they have a product out there. Now, if somebody invests in a biotech industry, they're not expecting returns to come out in five years. But if you look at a lot of the biotech stocks in India or even abroad, they still grow consistently in terms of their stock price or people's mindsets. And that's because whatever the management team commits to achieve, uh, even if it's non-financial, they deliver on that. 
And that's more important. So whether it's, you know, for them it's clinical trials and where they are with the process with FDA, how they're going to get something approved. For you, it could be how many users am I getting on board? What is my retention rate? Is my ticket size of what people are ordering uh, increasing over time? Because uh, you also have to keep in mind that the five years, the three years will involve a lot of capital investment, right? And sometimes that capital investment will overshadow the true juice in the business, which is the growth. So the growth might be fairly justified and, and good in itself, but when people juxtapose that with a short-term lens of investment, um, then it might get muddled. And maybe that's not the right way to look at it always. So you have to work with the investor or your partner to really have a, a horizon of deliverables that doesn't necessarily work around break-even. It's great if you get it, right? It's great if you can clearly articulate that in three years, if I get this revenue number, this uh, customer base, I will be break-even. But I don't think it's the end-all, be-all. Uh, for most, some businesses don't work like that. Yeah. It does seem to have this uh, issue with consumption story, you know, with the way the consumption happens uh, in the Western world. So, and I'm sure, like you're saying that in your experience, when you started the business in 2007-8 at Rain Bell, you would have had your uh, way when you would not get the kind of estimated customer base you would have thought of. And then either uh, you do get bogged down by the numbers if you keep looking at them, saying that this has not happened. So, you tend to either have the patience to keep waiting, be patient about it and stick around in the business and see how in, in some cases your unit economics as you said would keep coming in. But what is the other thing you would possibly look at? I mean, would you move on to some alternate channels to ensure that the clock keeps ticking and ensures that you don't get phased out in the business in the next, if, if the gestation period is probably about five years? You know, two really important things, especially when you're working with investors. Look, they have pressure to meet their numbers, right? They want to deliver to their LPs. I've seen businesses, and I would give you examples. Mintra is actually a great example. When Mintra started, Mintra was doing a lot of personalized gifting. They were doing mugs, T-shirts. You could upload your photos on T-shirts. Today, they're a pure online retailer, right? Now, I think somewhere when they started the business, there was this belief that we will engage this space in India and really become big. But once you have investors sitting on you and you see the growth not matching up to the expectations, there is, hey, if Flipkart's growing XYZ or somebody else is growing bonkers in the same e-commerce space, why don't you just change your model and do it? Uh, and there's a lot of pressure like that. And sometimes even for the entrepreneur, the pressure is too much uh, and, and the number enticement is too much to then still be committed to your initial vision. I think, therefore, it's important to pick the right partner, A, who will ride the tide with you. Uh, but that's just one layer. So that's radically changing your model. The, the other is, how do I just innovate around distribution channels, which was your other question. Now, with Supreme Globally, right, we are purely online. We, we have a lot of customers coming in on the website. We have the metrics of cost of acquisition, average order value, peak season, all of that jazz. In India, in the initial phase, you might need new ways to get, reach out to customers, right? Maybe it's kiosks in a store like Chroma. Maybe it's standalone shops. Maybe it's partnering with um, this huge chain of middlemen that exists in the printing industry. And how do you leverage some of those to still get you the business? That's a very different line of expansion or adjusting your business than just changing it completely at the basic offering level. And I think it's important to make that distinction. The latter will really help you stick to your vision, keep you motivated, because even if you're adding new channels, you are essentially sticking to what your initial dream was. And I, I personally believe that it's a lot easier to do the proof of concept type experiments in the latter as well. The former might be easier because if you see a flip card, you know, doing X thousand orders a day, uh, you would just say, look, if I spend that much in marketing, I should get at least X percent share. And that becomes a very numerical exercise. But doing the innovation on the distribution channels, I think is to, will give you a lot of kick, not just you, the team, and even the investors. So that's the absolute right way to go. Thank you. Sure. Uh, when you say execution, it's uh, across the board. So, and deliver it to the client. Yeah. So, the the way our model works is, um, you know, think about a little print shop. There are ten people. Each of them want hundred business cards. You go to a print shop. The guy will say, "Okay, come in. I'll give you a hundred cards." The next guy comes in. Here's your file. I'll give you the hundred cards. Right? He'll do it one by one in a batched fashion. What Visaprint's model is is that I'll take all of those ten together. And I will not use the small machine, which allows me to do only 100 or 200 cards. I will go to the big mother machine 
that requires a minimum of 500 or 1,000, right? So in terms of quality, you're significantly upgrading yourself because you're going from a machine that does your basic printing to the machine that does your magazine and book printing. And because I'm getting all 10 of them together, my cost is divided over those 10. And therefore, each of those individual customers will get the benefit of my aggregation. I will get benefit because I'm cutting down my cost significantly. And from a quality perspective, the customers are significantly upgrading themselves. So it's, it's really once the customer comes in the door and sees the quality, the price that he or she is paying is not that much more than what they're paying today. So once they see the quality, they're like, oh, geez, it's 10x the quality for the same price. It's a no-brainer. Why wouldn't I do it? Uh, and that's really the disruption that Vistaprint brought in the industry that Printbell tried to bring uh, five years ago as well, is how do we leverage the best-in-class printing but divide the costs in such a way that the individual customer, even though he or she might want only 100, because you know, the other bottleneck is if you go to a good printer, you have to get at least 1,000 printed, be that embroidered T-shirts or flyers, brochures, anything. So Vistaprint has taken that out of the window and said we will still use the best-in-class printing but we will not burden the customer with costs um, that come with it. And that's been the win-win uh, for the model. So it's not a cooperative, it's more of a centralized printing. Uh, so you handle all the execution. Sorry, I, I didn't follow that. So you handle all the execution? Yes. Yes. I think it's important to do that just from a quality perspective. Because in India, you know, it's so diverse, the, the quality parameters for printing. If you really want to own it, Printbell, we started outsourcing. We had no choice. I don't want to invest the money, right? So we did everything outsourced. Uh, and if that would mean monitoring it constantly, then so be it. But now that we've got the capital, we've done the proof of concept, we've got some base, it makes sense now to invest for the next five years. I don't know how strict we follow the time guidelines, but I'm getting the red blink here. Um, so I'll... Uh, Maybe one last question. Do we have time for that, or do we just one last? Yes. You know, I, I personally believe, and this is just my hypothesis. I, I might be proven completely wrong in five years. I think in India, in e-commerce specifically, if you compete on price, it's not a sustainable story. You're not going to be able to do that. I think the market dynamics are such that it's very difficult to compete on price. So how quality. So the idea was if you go to a local print shop, right, and you spend 400 rupees to get 500 business cards, which are both sides, you compare that card stock, that print quality, with what you got at Printbell. And it was obvious, even to the layman, that this is substantially better. It's not even like you're going from an Indica to a Manza. It was like going from an Indica to an Audi. So it was a it was significant step up in quality. I could still do that because I was using the aggregation technology in the back end. So I wasn't incurring that much more cost because I was pooling a lot more customers. And I think that's really what helped grow the business and create that 75% plus retention rate. If I competed on price, I wouldn't have survived. No way. So thank you guys. Um, hopefully this wasn't that boring, even though it was in the middle of the afternoon. Uh, and of course, if there are questions, I would encourage you to go to our site, check out what we've done so far. And if there are more questions, I'll be hanging around outside uh, to have a quick chat. Thank you. Thank you, Nilesh.